Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Paradeep Phosphates Limited Q2 FY23 earnings conference call hosted by ICICI Securities. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star and zero on your touchdown phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Sanirutta Joshi from ICICI Securities. Thank you and over to you, sir. Without fear, when uh, it's like... Andrew, sir, may I request you to please uh, repeat? The line was not unmuted. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, on behalf of ICICI Securities, we welcome you all to Q2 FY23 Results Conference Call of Paradip Phosphates. We have with us Senior Management, represented by Mr. Suresh Krishnan, Managing Director, Mr. Sablin Nandi, President and COO, and Mr. Alok Saxena, General Manager, and Head of Corporate Finance. Now I hand over the call to the management for initial comments, and then we will open the floor for question and answer session. Thanks, and over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Anirudh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to our earnings call, Q2 FI23. Our earnings presentation is available on our website as well as stock exchange websites, and a copy of which is circulated to you all. Hope you all have the opportunity to go through the same We'll be happy to take any questions at the end of this presentation. This is our second interaction on the quarterly earnings call, and there might be few participants who have joined us for the first time. Coming to the company overview, Paradi Phosphate is one of the leading private phosphatic fertilizer producers in the country and is engaged in manufacturing, trading, distribution, and sales of primary complex fertilizers. We have a capacity of 3 million metric tons of fertilizer through two plants, located at Paradip and Goa, respectively. We cater to a large number of farmers right across all 16 states in India through our, fan, uh, our flagship brands, Jekisan and Navratna. Overall, on the industry level, the H1 FI23 was a challenging period. The geopolitical instability arising out of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine has significantly affected supply chain of key commodities of our sector. The supply chain distortions have led to the deficit in the supply of essential commodities, and this has resulted in sharp increase in raw material prices. Coming to the market side, India is the second largest consumer market for fertilizers in the world, next only to China. Rising population, limited land availability, and squid input usage are key growth drivers for the growth of Indian fertilizer market. Good monsoons, various government initiatives or subsidy schemes, easy credit availability, investment improvement, creating better market facilities, promoting infrastructure development, etc., help to increase the sector's productivity. As we are all aware that in this sector, Indian government's initiatives along with the various steps taken by the, by the manufacturing companies and trading companies have ensured that Indian farmers have not been affected by the global uncertainties and also the volatility in prices and the inflation for the farmer over the last 12 months have been reasonably, uh, the, all prices have been reasonably the same levels. Fin just to give you the financial highlights for the half year ended September 2022, as you're all already aware, PPL is one of the largest private sector companies in India having an integrated phosphating manufacturing setup. During the quarter, PPL registered a revenue of 28,637 million, growing 48% on year on year and 18% on sequential basis. The revenue growth was primarily driven by the higher volumes of fertilizer production and wider distribution network of channel partners. For the quarter, PPL saw an adjusted EBITDA of Rs. 2,300 million and a profit of Rs. 511 million. A one-time expense and a delay in commissioning of the NPK trains at the Goa plant resulted in higher fixed costs and a consequential impact on our EBITDA. The overall profitability and margins were affected due to an increase in raw material prices. Working capital for the industry has remained stretched owing to higher cost of inventory and longer receivable cycle compared to last year. Our efficient manufacturing process has ensured cost competitiveness, resulting in an EBITDA per ton or rupees 5,179 for Q2 FI 2023. 
We hope to see better financial performance in the coming quarters owing to seamless integration and improved capacity utilization of Goa plant and stability in our raw material prices. I'm delighted to share that as on 1st June 2022, as you're all aware, we acquired the Goa facility. The plant has an annual capacity of 0.8 million tons of phosphatic and 0.4 million tons of urea respectively. Post the acquisition, our annual capacity has now risen to 3 million tons per annum. We have been able to start its operation in full swing and all the three trains at Goa are fully operational as of now. We will be able to capitalize on the sales and distribution network of Goa plant, the addition of brands of DAP and NPK, urea and ammonia to product portfolio will help us further solidify our market position. We recorded a total fertilizer production of 5,6194 metric ton during the quarter, which is an increase of 37% on year on year basis. During the quarter, we manufacture a higher amount of N20 over other NPKs and DAP to cater to the growing market demand. We have launched new grades of NPKs like 14280, 142813, and NPK242400 as part of our initiative to expand the product portfolio, largely aimed at improving farmers' choice for their soil-specific and crop-specific applications. We believe the fertilizer demand will remain firm for the commencing rabi season, given the low stock and high reservoir levels. With these opening thoughts, we can now move. We can now open the floor to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Anyone who wish to ask a question may please press star and one at this time. The first question is from the line of Deepak as an integer investor. Please go ahead. So I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, is there any legal hurdles in the acquisition of a Goa plant, the land acquisition? We do not have any legal hurdles as far as the Goa acquisition is concerned. Even if the land is concerned, we have already executed the agreement and we are there for registering this soon. Because uh, some newspapers are reporting that PMR has been uh, involved in this. Uh, is it true, sir? Some Goa, some Goa newspapers are saying this. No, no, we have seen newspaper items. We have also seen newspaper items, but as far as we are concerned, the land acquisition of our 262 acres is not under any any such hassle. Okay, sir. Second, and the second part is, sir, the, you said the raw, the, the raw material cost has impacted the profitability. So, uh, how do you look at the, uh, looking forward, how does, it, how does it look, sir? Well, the raw material prices have been going up over the last, uh, I would say, over nine months now. And we are now seeing a stability in the market. As you know, one of the key raw material for us is rock phosphate and phosphoric acid. And both have kind of peaked uh, during the last six months. And we are getting to see a correction in the global front, and which will also benefit us as far as the local market is concerned. And the high prices of nitrogen, which is ammonia as an input for us, continues to be the case. However, the Indian, Indian markets have been having a much better pricing as compared to what we get to see in Europe and North America. But we are not seeing a major downward revision out there. They are, they, are, they are getting stabilized at a particular level. We have seen steep corrections in sulfur, which is again a key raw material for us. But currently, it is uh, consolidating at a, at a particular level. And, but it's no, nowhere near the highs that we have seen uh, six months back. Okay. So we are looking this is positive for the sector. So do we get more subsidies, sir, because it's uh, any formula from the government for the subsidies for increasing raw materials, sir? Increased subsidy will be coming in? Government has corrected the subsidy uh, because of the increase in global raw material as of 1st of April 2023. And they have recently, a few months back, a uh, few days back, they have come out with a new circular for the subsidy for the rest of the year. And I think the, the kind of support that government has offered, it's positive for the farmer for sure. And it takes into the consideration that industry needs to continue to have a robust performance. So I think uh, we are now in a very fair wicket in terms of the government initiative as the subsidy is concerned. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. A reminder to our participants, please press star and one if you wish to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Nitin Avasti from Incred Equities. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Um, this was a question on the industry. So, uh, there is a lot of talk about nano urea going around and a lot of difficulty in getting the right data on it. So, if you could shed some light on it, uh, what I've understood till now is that the patient is with the government, uh, PICO has it, and they are passing it on to the public sector fertilizer units. But does that mean the private will have to pay for that patient? or will the private sector also get this? And also, is this a less energy-intensive uh, production process for nano urea? So will we be able to consume lesser resources to make the same amount of impact on ground with nano urea? Uh, just for your understanding, uh, the Indian uh, urea industry is close to about 35 million tons. I mean, it, it kind of swings between 33 to 35 million tons annually. Out of this, uh, Eight, seven to eight billion tons is the imported content of urea as far as the local market is concerned. What we see as nano urea is primarily a liquid urea, which is not subsidized by government of India. And it is believed that this particular urea can be a, a part substitute for the urea which is being consumed in India. And just for your information, this is a non-subsidized product. There is no pressure on any private sector company to purchase this and retail the same. This is available in the market, and these kind of specialized products do not make a very major swing as far as the overall consumption of urea is concerned. Yes, it will. They will be a part of the urea market, which could finally become a nano urea market, which could be beginning from a, I would say, a 5% to a best of 10%. And these are early days, so it will be difficult to kind of put a number to it. But it's not a major swing. It's a trend that we're getting to see, which we believe is not going to exceed more than 10% in the long run. Um, got it, sir. But uh, when you say that, you kind of uh, differ from many of the government office, officials' views, which says that this is going to become a major product. Well, uh, this is a product which is being developed, uh, uh, developed as a as a good substitute for urea, which will be kind of in the long term basis. And as far as we as a company is concerned, we're not a major urea player. We are primarily a phosphatic player, and urea at this becomes an, a bit of a raw material for us when it comes to NPKs. And a small quantity we sell to our network based on our manufacturing facility. So it's not a major impact for our company. No picture. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Risham Jain from DFP Investment Managers. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening, sir. So a uh, few uh, uh, bookkeeping questions and then a uh, few more. So first is, uh, what was the EBITDA of Paradeep in this quarter? Just give us all your questions and we'll, we'll respond. Yeah, yeah uh, so that was the first one. Second is, uh, did we take any inventory provisioning in this quarter, uh, given that uh, the prices of raw material has uh, corrected a lot? So is there an element of uh, any inventory provisioning in this quarter? And uh, lastly, sir, uh, if you look at uh, <coughs> some of the other uh, uh, your peer players, uh, what we have seen is that uh, uh, in, in first half, so Q1, Q2, both we have seen uh, uh, margins being uh, better uh, versus uh, first half of last year. While in our case, uh, the margins are uh, on a lower side. So how should one, uh, what, what was the difference uh, in our case is the third question. Thank you. Resham, coming to the inventory provisioning, I think I'd like to respond to that first. Uh, well, there have been some changes in the fertilizer subsidy for the coming six months which is effective from 1st of October, which has an impact on your uh, uh, finished goods, and that entire provisioning has been taken by us. So that import, the, the, the changes in subsidy rates which have been announced have been fully provided for. 
And as far as the imported raw material is concerned, as you're all well aware, that we have about normally about one stock available with us as far as raw material is concerned. And from the second month in the quarter, we start getting the benefit of the lower prices of raw material. So in effect, if you're, if you're seeing about a 20% drop in the, in the raw material prices, the impact of that in the books will be roughly about 15%. So we would see that from last, last quarter to this quarter, the raw material prices coming down to 15% is something is what we expect to see as a benefit uh, for the company. As far as the individual epic numbers are concerned, of the left heavily to respond. Yeah, and also to add to the first point, the inventory provisioning or the hit that we have taken is of the order of 11 crores. The reported EBITDA for the quarter uh, is uh, 188 crores, but there has been some one-off expenses of the order of around 42 crores. So the adjusted EBITDA is 230 crores for this quarter. Sir, I was asking about uh, Paradeep uh, uh, X Goa. What is the EBITDA? Because uh, that is more comparable on a like-to-like -like basis because Goa was not there last year. So last year, I think our EBITDA was 268 crores. It is better that you start looking at a bit at a company level because this is what uh, you know would be the right picture of the company. Pre-listing, it was a different one. You know, this is what uh, is going to be the norm going forward, which is at a company level EBITDA. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, would, you will not be able to share the EBITDA of Paradeep this quarter. Not right now. I'll tell you the reason. Not that we do not want to share. It is because Goa has run for one month, 20 days. It is not fair to compare a one month, 20 days performance of Goa and, and also the fact that the fixed cost of Goa has hit its EBITDA for the entire quarter because we acquired the asset on 1st of June. So to report an earning against a fixed cost, earning of only one month, 20 days, and having a fixed cost loaded for the entire quarter is not fair. So right now, please, uh, you know, our request is to look at the company level at a time and once we have stabilized Goa and right now we are happy to report that we are running Goa full blast. At a suitable time, we will hopefully be in a position to share Goa's numbers as well. Goa has been, a, you know, has dragged down people standalone. One won't deny that. But it is not without reason. And it's not that Goa is unnecessarily dragging down. Goa is performing... Uh, to the to the expected levels uh, already. Okay, and the last one, sir. Uh, the profitability of uh, Paradi versus the peer company, uh, which has actually reported much better numbers than uh, us. So, uh, no, I, I think you have to look when you look at the profitability here. I think we 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 are very clear that uh, we are doing perfectly fine as far as the EBITDA line is concerned. And so, in fact, uh, you know, again, I would like you to relook at the numbers that you are referring to and whichever competition you are referring to. Uh, uh, we can, our numbers give a different picture. I think we have done much better than our own guidance uh, in terms of a bit of a time and uh, better than many of the competition. I don't know who you specifically are referring to, but again, most of the uh, peers we have done better this quarter actually. Okay. Because we don't have anything to compare with because uh, EBITDA itself is not there with us. Uh, to evaluate itself will be a difficult task for us in a way. So anyways, it's fine. Uh, thank you. So which EBITDA do you not have? Sorry. The Sorry. Paradeep EBITDA because uh, EBITDA per ton has to be compared uh, on a like-to-like -like basis, which is not possible for us to do. No, we are not comparing Paradeep EBITDA. We are comparing CPM's EBITDA with that CPM, of the other yeah, company's yeah. EBITDA. Yeah, yeah, so that is what I was asking actually. Paradeep means I was actually asking for PPL's a bit only. Uh, it's already there in the press release that was released and also on the investor position that we have. PPL's a bit for the, for the for Q2 FI23 is at 5,179 rupees a ton. And as far as okay. H1 is okay. concerned, it is at 4,568 rupees a ton. Okay, okay, got it, sir. I think uh, this is what I was looking for. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Prashant Deyani from Elara Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so how do you see the production levels for H2 for PPL and Goa plant? Uh, uh, it's, uh, the production and sales volume should now normalize for both uh, complex and urea. 
Yeah, so, um, hi Prashant. So, uh, in terms of, as we have said, that we have been going through, in, I'll go plan by plan, Paradeep and then Goa. So, in Paradeep, of the pr four production trains, we have had one train down for revamp all through the year. But as we speak now, that fourth and the last train is coming back. So we, are, we have been running all through this fiscal year, uh, uh, three trains running in Paradeep. Uh, but now, sometime in the next two, three days, we are going to have the fourth train running. So the production uh, standalone at Paradeep will, will go up. As far as Goa is concerned, Goa has already achieved its steady state of production. All three trains, Urea and the two NPK trains, are running uh, uh, at 100% capacity utilization. Okay. And sir, after we this, uh, our, we are close to sorry, we are close to our uh, run rate of uh, uh, of that uh, you know three million per annum number. Sure. And sir, uh, uh, for the uh, maybe say uh, fourth asset inventory that we would have had of uh, procurement price of seventeen hundred uh, dollars. For CTL uh, uh, standalone as well as for the Goa plant, how many days of inventory would we have? I don't want the exact number, but a ballpark indication just to assess the profitability. No, to just to let you know that as far as the the higher level, the 1715 level of phosphoric phosphoric acid is concerned, we are we are pretty much fully utilized as you speak. Yeah, and CTL did not take any uh, cargo at 1715. Correct. And so for Goa plant uh, was uh, October, uh, I mean, uh, for the entire month of October, have we had that $1,700 uh, dollar in yes. or y Yes. The, 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 the month of October was at $1,715 uh, inventory. From going forward from now onwards, we will now be moving to the, uh, the newer price. Then, sir, uh, is it that the Goa plant profitability could be better than uh, your expectation if the raw material prices continue to decline? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it will Goa plant will be like what the rest of the industry will have, and you know, one must also realize that even for uh, this is at an industry level, even for a plant like Faradis, the raw acid prices are linked to the false acid prices, so there will be a uh, you know, whatever ha ha so no no P grade commodity, whether it is a rock phosphate or false acid, is isolated from each other. They are all linked. So an improvement in false acid prices, which is more publicized, is also going to have a, uh, a, a you know corresponding improvement in rock phosphate price, rock phosphate prices as well. Actually, so that was my next question. After this downward division in false acid price, uh, where uh, should the or could the rock phosphate prices settle at? Just for similar, this down similar percentage reduction. Around uh, thirty percent reduction from three twenty dollars. Correct, 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 correct. Okay. And sir, uh, what to, uh, what EBITDA per ton would you be targeting for next year uh, at the entity level? No change in our guidance. We maintain that. As I said, you know, you you know, we would we as a management team are committed to making sure that Goa runs well. That's where our full attention is going. We are maintaining what we have said before our IPO, which is 4,000 to 4,500 uh, uh, rupees per ton. For 24. Yeah. I think these numbers are achievable, and I think we are, we are seeing that now. So we expect that the, the average of 4,500 that we talked about is something that we should hold on to. Uh, sir, on the distribution side, I was just looking at the presentation. We are not there in Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, Rajasthan. Is it, uh, I mean, uh, distance-wise not possible to enter that, or do we have plans to enter that within the freight subsidy range? No, it's not that we don't want to enter. Our initial and primary commitment is to the farmers who are closest to us, and then we, as, 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 uh, uh, as we progressively go farther away from the plants, it depends on what those farmers need and our ability to supply. So I'm sure when we are running full blast, and today you know, it also has a seasonality and non-seasonality element to it. So for example, the rubby consumption has already started and it is coming out very well, as you would have heard from other companies as well. So we are now trying to kind of make sure that we supply to our immediate markets first, because that's how, how, where our primary commitment lies. 
in a in a year when there will be glut and less demand we certainly will look at the states which are sort of far 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 away from us so we don't have a bias against any of the far flung states but it is just that we believe our primary commitment are to the states where we fundamentally serve and where we have been serving for the last 40 50 years which is maharashtra karnataka uh, ap telangana bengal bihar odisha eastern up etc chatisgarh uh, as of now we don't have plans to enter these states as we as of now we don't have products to enter these states okay certainly not gujarat and rajasthan uh, so uh, which products are prevalent mostly in these markets you know gujarat and rajasthan are two states especially gujarat as you know has got all the ports in india and it's also got manufacturing facility so every importer gets in there and residual quantity is going there so we're not really looking at gujarat as a state to expand with that traditional products i mean as and when we come with uh, the newer ideas and a more innovative products one will always explore these markets no and, and tamil nadu sells uh, you know our our uh, the products that we make which is mainly n20 it's a big market for n20 so we can get into those markets it's not an issue we need to have enough products to serve those markets sure Uh, sir, uh, our presentation was not having the sales volume data. Can you share that? The Q2 sales number is four forty three four four seven. H1 sale number is seven seven six zero two nine. The bifurcation in urea and complex. Urea, in fact, uh, I will produce about one lakh twenty four thousand. Here, rest everything is complex. And everything is sold, uh, whatever we have produced. Yes, the, the sales number is indicating that. You know, we have sales of seven eighty nine eight one eight, and we typically have a one month inventory at the end of the year, end of the end of the quarter, or end of any month for that matter. For that matter. So that is why uh, can we get the exact figure, please? No, we no we gave you the exact figure of sales. No? Yeah, Julia, exact sale is one twenty six thousand tons. For the quarter. And Goa complex. Goa complex sales for the quarter is forty-three uh, thousand tons. So we produced uh, at Goa about uh, two lakh nine thousand and one. Sorry, two lakh nine thousand fifteen, out of which one twenty-four three seventy-five UDR. That's right? everything is complex. Okay. Uh, so in Q2, how much subsidy have we received? Yeah, I mean, uh, close to what 1,800 crores is what we got in Q2. Yeah. And have we received anything in October? Uh, we got a special amount of money in October. Yeah. Uh, how much? It was October was close to about 800 crores. Okay, and lastly, sir, this forty-two uh, crore one-time impact cost does it include eleven and eleven crore of inventory provision? No, that's over and above that. Okay, so net uh, net it could be around fifty-two crore something. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you, sir. That's it from my side. Thank you. Anyone who wish to ask a question at this time, they may please press star and one. The next question is on the line of Darshita from Antique. Please go ahead. Hi, hope I'm audible. Yes, you're audible. Yeah. So uh, my first question wasn't uh, wasn't lines with. Uh, so one of our competitors had faced some issue in terms of the subsidy that they received on DAB. Uh, uh, on the on the opening inventory that they had so i wanted some idea on that did we have anything or uh, did we say something similar to that of our competitor so we have taken care of the provisioning of whatever is required in terms of opening stock of uh, where dap is concerned okay so we did not face any such issue right in terms of uh, whatever what whatever was required under the government uh, government policy we have we have made those provisions And as far as the opening stock is concerned, we have also taken the hit. These numbers are after that. So, could you quantify the amount of that hit? I think if you look at it, I mean, the, I mean, the net net uh, number for us is something that 
I mean, I don't have it right away. I mean, there's something that we can we can take it up later. But uh, as far as we are concerned, the the opening stock that we had, we had made uh, we have had necessary provisioning available for that. Yeah. So could you and provide the opening stock? The 11.5 11, 11 crores that we've done even this quarter is largely towards that only. It is a subsidy reduction that has been there. All right, all right, okay. Uh, and could you provide the opening inventory number in, if, if that's possible? As far as this, uh, as far as, as far as yes. we are concerned, uh, if you look at the November first uh, opening uh, opening number, we largely have uh, we largely have an N20 stock and some amount of DAP stock that is available with us. So now I was talking about the one where we took the reversal for DAP. So DAP reversal, no, we did not take a reversal on DAP. We actually took a reversal on on the reduction in subsidy which happened effective uh, end of uh, end of this quarter, which is on September 30th. Right. So I was talking about the opening inventory of that. So on what inventory did we take the reversal? Totally, we had inventory of close to about one lakh tons of DAP and the N20 both put together. So we had to take a reversal on both, and to a certain extent. And okay. DAP was about uh, uh, and that and the Last, largest sum was for N20, which was there, and the lesser and the lesser quantities were for for DAP. The total put together was about 100,000 tons of fertilizer that we had the end of the, end of, as an opening balance. Okay, uh, okay. And the second question is on. Uh, so uh, the government recently corrected, like you know, uh, re reduced the subsidy of DAP by almost uh, 1,500 per ton. Uh, but when we see the reduction in raw material prices, they are not in the tune of how much, uh, like you know, the reduction in raw material prices is larger than that of how much uh, subsidy has been reduced for that. Uh, so do we see any kind of correction happening in the product prices or something like that during the quarter? I think government, if you look at it, it's not, if you look at the DAP correction they have done, they have actually taken the actual prices as to the regular policy. They have looked at the factor which affects you in terms of nitrogen. They look at what happens to phosphate and it's done accordingly. As far as our product mix is concerned, it's not unduly going to change based on this current, current circular which is there. We would actually, we change our product mix based on market needs. So today we are getting into a rubby season where certain amount of higher quantities of uh, DAP will certainly be manufactured by us. Uh, to take care of the needs of the northern and eastern markets. So our product mix is largely to do with what the farmer needs, not necessarily only with the government pricing policy. Right, right. So, so I mean, I was just trying to understand if we see any kind of uh, reduction happening in the prices uh, at the, like, you know, at the end level. I think, uh, so like, we used to take uh, DAP as reference, I think we, we increased the prices from 1200 to 1350. So do we see any reversal happening from 1350 to 1200 uh, because, as I mentioned, that the reduction in uh, uh, subsidy is not in tune with how the with the raw material prices reduction. We do not see any reduction, any change in the MRP of uh, DAP, and certainly not not going down. All right, all right, Mr. Sure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Any participants who wish to ask a question at this time, then please press star and one. The next question is on the line of Kaushik Bakshi from Prabhudas Dilladar. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, hi. Thank you for taking my question. This is Himanshu this time from Prabhudas Dilladar. So, sir, my question was pertaining to the phosphoric acid side. So, just wanted to have a sense is how much of backward integration do we have currently have into the phosphoric guide? So the phosphoric acid backward integration, uh, we are, uh, as we have mentioned, we are, un we are undergoing an expansion in uh, the Paradi plant. Uh, post completion of the expansion, we should be uh, close to 90 to 93 percent backward integrated. And with currently, a, currently, with, uh, how much we have? With a with an increased volume of 1.8, which we have already, which we have already achieved. So today we are less than that, but the project is uh, underway. So you know, before we increased our granulation, we were around 70% uh, backward integrated. Uh, now with the 50% increase in the granulation capacity going up from 1.2 million to 1.8 million, our phosphoric acid in-house capacity is going up from 0.3 million to 0.5 million. At a 0.5 million tons of phos acid and 1.8 million tons of granulation, we would be 90 to 93 percent backward integrated. Right. 
so sir my first question was pertaining to this only so so having a 90% sort of phosphoric acid backward integration but still we are guiding for a 4000 to 4500 rupees sort of EBITDA per ton and assuming that the phosphoric acid are likely to stay at this level or maybe a slight moderation from the current level so we just wanted to have a sense on the margin side so are we trying to guide on the conservative side or what is actually stopping us from making money basically i think we not i think it's, it's it's very important for you to to realize that we are through a very volatile situation and as a, as we've always maintained when it comes to the our performance we would certainly be uh, be one of the one of the better ones as far as the industry is concerned and as far as the guidance of 4500 rupees that we talked about is is something which is been seen in the industry and it's something which has been the kind of average that we are looking at today and once the volatility subsides and everything happens and the markets are in a different rate one could always revisit this but given the complexity that we are seeing today we believe this is the right way to go so and and a small you know i'm sure you've noted this but i'd like to point out in light of your question so the 90 to 93% backward integration refers to the parathi plant not as ppl as a company goa plant is not backward integrated and depends 100% on imported assets the 4000 to 4500 rupees per metric ton ebitda guidance is for ppl as a company and not for any site right got it sir so sir ask can you give us sense any sense on what is the stand alone parathi uh, ebitda per ton for the first half no that as i said it will not be fair for us to give this guidance with one only one month and 20 days of uh, goa plant having run uh, give us some more time let us stabilize uh, the operations of goa uh, we hopefully uh, in future we'll be able to give that as of now because we are going to give you the uh, we'd like to only share the company level ebitda per ton right so because because the reason behind asking this question was when when we look at the competition so having a much lower in terms of backward integration but still they have been like able to make a very high ebitda per ton so just wanted to have a sense that despite we are having almost on 70% 70 to 75% currently backward integration on the phosphoric acid but still we are not able to make an ebitda per ton which is like equivalent or higher basically to the competition so what yes sir please, 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 please sir. Uh, i think you need to realize two facts out here first is the mm-hmm. 70% that we talked about was assuming that we had a full capacity of granulation available as far as paradip was concerned in paradip we are running with one granulation less that that's the first point and that is because mm-hmm. of the revamp so paradip itself will get into its full capacity utilization pretty soon which will be in, a, in, in during the next 7 to 10 days once that happens the 70% will actually come down because we will not have the asset plan fully commissioned once the asset plan also gets commissioned during the q4 of this financial year then we would have an entire setup where we'll have a backward integration which goes to about 90% when it comes to goa our our, our backward integration is only to the extent to the extent of ammonia that we get we do not have any phosphoric acid at all out there but the key point that we are trying to highlight out here is once we stabilize our goa operation the goa quantities of phosphoric acid will be crystallized and our commercial efficiencies will kick in along with that and then you will be in a position to see how well we do vis-a-vis the competition that we are talking about no and i would also like to mention that based on whatever data we have i think we are still reporting the best in class ebitda per ton in spite of uh, being uh, uh, not having all the backward integration capabilities having kicked in uh, that's point one second point is even with the full phosphate plant coming in and the full granulation coming in for fy 23 24 we are still maintaining a guidance of 4000 to 4500 rupees per metric ton ebitda right and so one 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 last question from my end so if it is possible for you to share the capacity utilization at the paradip level and the company level both for the granulation or the complex fertilizer plant as well as the phosphoric acid plant they are running pretty much uh, uh, you know the phosphate plant is running full blast we have had an annual shutdown in q1 but q2 has been pretty steady uh, when it comes to the granulation uh, facility as i said we are of the four trains we are running three trains so it's around 75% utilization in paradi and at the company level you mean with goa goa as i said mm-hmm. it's for one month 20 days out of the three months of the quarter 
Just to okay. put it in perspective for you, annually we should be doing about 14 lakh tons. As against that, today we are reporting about 7.5 lakh tons. So that's, that's, that's the number that we have. But as you go forward, this, 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 this matrix will change with, uh, with capacity kicking in in both, both locations fully. Got it, sir. Got it. Thank you. That is from my side. Thank you. The next question is in the line of Jayesh Gandhi from Baroda BNP Paribas Asset Management. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening. Am I audible? Hello. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you are. Please go ahead. Most of my questions have been answered, yet I have a few more. Uh, first of all, just to reiterate and confirm, the 4,500 EBITDA per ton guidance is for this year, right? FI 23. And next year as well. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Uh, you don't think next year can be better or you want to revise it in, uh, at the beginning of next week? No, as, I said, as Mr. Krishnan said, it is very volatile and we also need to experience the high volume of, of a run rate of 3 million and stabilize our operations. There are a lot of improvement projects underway right now in, uh, in Paradis. There is an energy improvement project underway in Goa. Let all those projects get, you know, we are like, we, uh, we don't want to get into a situation where we are over promising. So we would like to maintain 4,500 as of now for next year as well. So fair enough. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to ask that. Uh, assuming some of these projects get implemented, you would then look for a revision later on. Yeah. Fair enough. Yes, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So, so that was first question. The other question I had is that, uh, you know, uh, earlier this year, there was this uh, uh, talk or, or at least uh, indication from the government about marketing and, you know, doing some uh, on the ground, uh, you know, single branding from government's point of view because they are the ones who are doing the subsidy. What is the impact of that? Could you quantify that? Or, or could you indicate how have uh, fertilizer companies like yourself uh, dealt with this uh, change? Well, from effective uh, January 1st, 2023, it is widely expected that the government will be introducing the Bharat brand across urea, NPK, and DAP. So that, that, that clarity is emerging uh, as we speak right now. And as far as we are concerned, you know, we, our brand is all about our connect with the farmer. So that mm -hmm. our brand and our connect with the farmer continues in terms of what we end up doing, in terms of all the extension activities and the visibility which is there, and which mm -hmm. also gets promoted through the retail points that we have. So those efforts will continue. And I will, I mean, so that, that's where it is, but if it, is, it will finally have an impact in terms of uh, the, the brand awareness or any, any offtake, if something is too early to say, but we are we are continue we continue to focus with the farmer with our brand and, and activities. Right. So um, I guess the question I have is that how will you differentiate the branding for all the uh, players in similar? How will you differentiate? No. So there is a one third space that is given to the uh, manufacturers to uh, to keep the brand message on. So, you know, I will just extend from what Mr. Krishnan said. Uh, you know, it can, it, it's early days for anybody to comment on what will happen. So, but in all likelihood, it would be a combination of the following. One is, yes, there would be the, the branding message that will be communicated will be done in a different way from what it was done so far. So far, we have the full bag, full our own color, etc. So, if it gets implemented, that will get that will change. But at the same time, because of this uniform or standardization, there it would also lead to some cost savings at the individual uh, producer end. And those things we are working out. Those things we we will need to uh, uh, work more around. But uh, we can already see some of those opportunities coming in front of us. Okay. Uh, uh, so again, question related to the same matter. Would it be different for NPK or DAP? For example, if you were to do only DAP, then the branding or the, or the uh, standardization would be different. And if you had different varieties of NPK, you would be able to do more branding yourself? Now, as we speak, uh, the, the branding is going to be common right across all the nutrients, NP and K. So you'll have a Bharat DAP, Bharat NPK, and Bharat uh, uh, urea, but the only good thing that happens with NPK is based on your grade, grade of fertilizer and the acceptability of that with the farmer, you obviously get a preference when it comes to the, the sales in the retail end. Exactly. So, so if you had a, a, have a combination of NPK which is different, 
uh, then, then you can do a more higher branding there or uh, at least have higher sales. You, your products will look the same, but obviously the, uh, your farmer connect will ensure that the farmer comes and asks for your product. Right, right, right. Okay, great. And, and my final question is, uh, uh, what would be the volume for the second half of this year uh, in terms of your production target? Would it be 1.5 million? Or would it be a lower number? Well, we, we, as you know, we are the month of November, and uh, the, the second, the last train of Goa, Paradeep is coming back on stream. So I, I think uh, we, should, uh, we should look for a guidance on this as we go to the Q3 call. And I'm expecting that the Q3, we will have the, 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 the we'll have a clear visibility in terms of how the run rate is picked up. And it is looking good today. Yeah, it will be around, uh, you know, 12 lakhs or so. Great. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ankur Ferival from Access Captain. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, sir. Uh, thanks, Abhi. Uh, first question on the overall volume front for this quarter. Uh, if if you would, uh, you know, probably break it up into traded and manufacturing. In your presentation, you do mention, you know. Ankur, no trading. Everything is manufactured. So the only uh, <coughs> volume traded is the MOP traded, which is there in the presentation. Is that right? Yeah, only MOP traded. Almost negligible, yeah. And same will be the case for Q1 or maybe year on year, on year basis as well? In Q1 we did about 49, see only cargo that we imported or DAP was roughly about 49,000 tons, yeah. which, we, which came in the month of April and which has been sold in the market. Yeah, so difference between Q1 and H1 is that if, if, uh, in Q1 it's only 29,000 tons of uh, MOP, in, uh, if you take H1 you can add another 50,000 tons of DAP to it, that's it. Okay. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Uh, second part, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the uh, the liquid nano, which you know uh, you clarified earlier as well. Uh, just trying to understand from a cost economics perspective, uh, if you could put some light there, because you know uh, what we generally see or hear is that you know obviously application of urea in a solid form is not as efficient. Probably you are using more urea in quantum versus what is required, while liquid will be more efficient. Uh, at the same time, liquid urea will be non-subsidized and not the government subsidy will be absent there. So from a farmer's perspective, uh, any thoughts, will nano urea will be value equitable or you know, how does the economic work there? Uh, well, uh, as an industry veteran, I can tell you these are early days. And nano urea is something which has just been introduced. And I think we'll, we'll have to wait and see the acceptance of the farmer and the impact it has for various crops and at various stages of application. So I think it's, it's truly an early days for us to really comment in terms of farmer economics as far as nano is concerned. Uh, sure, but, but any thought directionally, whether it will be too, uh, you know, too inefficient, maybe you know, some broad percentage terms also will be helpful from a direction perspective. No, no, the way we are looking at it today, it is not really giving us any clear direction in terms of where it is going. Yes, there is a lot of policy support which is coming in because it's a non-subsidized product. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Uh, uh, another question on the margins front. Uh, will it be fair to say uh, that on a Q1Q basis, there will be a margin improvement, uh, you know, let's say this quarter versus uh, the last quarter, Q1? We all work for Maybe. the same. We all expect that and we work for that. Uh, no, no. So I, I'm talking more historical. So this quarter, for example, uh, if our blended... Q3 is, uh, Q3 is always an important quarter because in the eastern and, and central part of India, northern part of India, Rabi is strong and we also get to see that in the western part. So this is a strong consumption time and so this always you'll see for the industry, it's an, uh, you do see products being sold both at the primary level and the farmer level both. Sure. Uh, where I was coming from was, you know, given Goa plant is not backward integrated, at least on the NTK side. Uh, and while, you know, Faraday obviously with, with incremental new capacity coming in for force, we will be effectively almost 90% plus integrated. Uh, on a blended basis, while the numbers are what you guided, 4,500 odd, you know, a bit per ton. Uh, on an individual basis, will Parazit be something like 6,000 and maybe Goa will be probably 2,500, 3,000? Will that be a fair? Differential between the two, or how should one look at it? 
you no know, ankur at the cost of being very boring and repetitive we would like to maintain the 4500 rupees per metric ton abita let's see where this quarter as i said you know we have just taken goa one month 20 days of running allow us to run and see the consumption window good demand that we have we have lined up all our raw materials goa is running so we can only say from and, and there are no market issues so let's see where our bottom line fits i don't want to you know put the cart before the horse let's just see the quarter and maybe from next next time when we have the discussion we will be able to give you better guidance we are just keeping our fingers crossed it's working well right now sure sure sir well no worries uh, just last thing on you know the capacity expansion uh, we do mention that 2300 odd acres that we have and almost one third is getting used right now uh, from a medium to long term perspective uh, our thoughts in terms of expansion uh, whether in fertilizers or in agri input side any thoughts there Well, as far as fertilizers is concerned, post the phosphoric acid expansion, we are certainly doing. We are expanding our capacity in sulfuric acid. We currently make 1,000, 1.3 million tons of sulfuric acid annually, and we believe that uh, we would need another uh, point, close to about 0.4 uh, million tons annually, and that that production is something that we are going to augment. As to the rest of the strategy is concerned, yes, we are working on it, and we are quite open, as you said, uh, in terms of taking up whether it is a Uh, whether it is other agri inputs including agrochemical or specialities and other products are concerned and uh, most of it is something that we will we will come back to you all uh, as we enter 2023 24 with our uh, fully rated and operational capacity of 3 million coming in yeah i just want to add uh, to what mr krishnan said so good part is that again whatever we have promised will be done in calendar year 22 is actually getting completed we are almost in the very world the end of uh, uh, some of these activities including ramping up goa fully so we remain very optimistic about uh, so uh, you know in terms of strategy and thinking our minds are virtually empty now so obviously we will not keep our minds empty for very long we are going to get into some interesting new projects so hopefully very soon Sure, sure, sir. Well, that's helpful. Thank you, and uh, all the best. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Dhruv Machak from HDFC Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, sir. Thank you so much, uh, and apologies if it, this is a bit repetitive. But I just wanted to reconfirm the sales numbers. Uh, for two Q, it is four lakh forty-three thousand tons, and no trading. Uh, for one Q, it was three lakh thirty-two, with forty-nine thousand tons of trading. That's right, sir. Yeah, four lakh forty-three thousand four forty-seven is the right number, and we have a small trading of MOP in this. Yeah, MOP has gone. Twenty-nine thousand six hundred thirteen. Yeah, twenty-nine thousand. And in one Q, it was three lakh thirty-two, of which forty-nine thousand was the DAP trading plus the MOP sum trading. Yeah, we had a DAP trading which was there. That's right, yes. And so, if you can give the same numbers for the last year uh, quarters. In fact, if you look at H1 FI twenty-two, I mean, I have H1 numbers. The MOP trading was about twenty-five thousand five eighty-four, and the DAP trade was about fifty-three thousand. Just for your understanding, you know, we normally plan only for two cargoes of DAP as a trade, one in each season. So that's what we kind of continue to do. Yeah, and just to you know, last year we had done a total uh, sale of uh, Q2 FY22 was three sixty-eight, and uh, H1 FY22 was five ninety-nine. And uh, there will be no. This is all complex. There will be no urea because urea is what now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This is not a like to like. That's why we are not highlighting that. So that was only Paradeep at that time. Yeah. And so the uh, the uh, the broad way you calculate EBITDA per ton is just this overall volumes divided by the EBITDA. Yes. No other adjustments. This includes the other way EBITDA divided by yeah, volume. EBITDA divided by the overall volumes. Got it. So I mean, just to you know, if I just look at the numbers, uh, just assuming that Goa would not have contributed significantly at the EBITDA level, also probably some negative contribution at the EBITDA level, given we understand it's just starting. Your know, EBITDA per ton just on uh, the Pradeep volumes would have improved significantly on a QOQ basis. Is that fair understanding? Yes. Yeah, you know, as I've been saying, we are we continue to be best in class on EBITDA, and as we have maintained. even in our run up to the ipo we, we there's no reason why paradi will not deliver best in class on ebita uh, uh, as a, as an organization and so that same uh, the same would hold true even on a yoy basis because if i just look at the volumes they would be absolutely yeah 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 yeah, yeah. you can do whatever calculations you want i don't want to be comparing ourselves with anybody but i i don't think anybody has any doubt about our uh, quality of ebita per ton it is the best in class 
So in your company's operations, you don't see much of a difference between first half and second half. No, 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 no. It's fine. It's it's okay for us. Okay. The second thought is, uh, in terms of your uh, capital allocation and the impact of the Goa acquisition on balance sheet, uh, what is the overall aggregate cost of the Goa acquisition? Is there any accumulated loss which you still have to provide for for the Goa acquisition? No, the total asset cost was 1,680 crores, and that's about all. And rest of it is what what you're getting to see in the in the P&L on a regular basis. We have we don't have to provide anything more. Okay, so and in terms of the uh, uh, you know planning for working capital, can we expect the working capital to decline and thereby what is the kind of reduction in gross and net that you can expect say in the second half and for the next year? If, if you if you look at the way things have been operating last year, we did not have much of a draw as far as the fund based working capital limits are concerned, and uh, so we were kind of having an average number of about 1200 crores is dead. But this year, uh, in the first six months, we have seen that the uh, fund-based utilization is high, primarily because of the subsidy element. And this is two reasons for this. The first reason being that the subsidy component per ton is more uh, as compared to the previous years. That's the first one. And the, the second is there was some delay initially from getting money from the government of India. Seems to have stabilized now, and we believe that things will only improve. And uh, Government is well financed and funded for the same. Okay. So, uh, what is the capex you have incurred in the first half, and what is the full year capex, including all the expansions you are talking about? Well, as far as the capex is concerned, we we are the major capex is only on the phosphoric asset plan that we need to incur this year, which will be about 150 odd crores, and that is what is currently under implementation. As for the granulation fees is concerned, about 70 crores is what we spent, you know. Yeah. So most of the capex has already been committed, and it is uh, you know because we are almost ending uh, uh, the last uh, stage of the capex. We are not so it will be wrong for us to say that the, these are all the quarter spending on capex. But you know, as Mr. Krishnan said on DAP revamp, which was a 220 crore, we have already incurred 209 plus. Uh, the 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 fourth asset expansion we have incurred over 160 crores. Uh, no, so most of the most of the work, the major projects, uh, the capex has already been committed or are in advanced stages of getting committed. That's about 310 to 20 crores all told. Okay. Yeah, that is the, that's that's the total capex that that was pending for us to to finally incur and which is which is being done. And as far as the current financial year is concerned, we have no more, no further capex to be either committed or spent beyond this year. So, so what will be the normal maintenance capex you have to do, say, over the next uh, two years, by 24 and 25? So that will be equal to our depreciation. You can approximately take that. Uh, it will be close to the depreciation number that we will have, which is around uh, slightly less than 200 crores. So based on all that you have said in terms of operational improvement... 100 crores. Yeah, okay, go ahead, yes. So, uh, in terms of the improved capacity utilization possible and the expansion, when do you see the full benefit of the, you know, phosphoric acid uh, project as well as the uh, granulation project all kicking in uh, in terms of the uh, impact on volume? Will it be all done in FI24 or will it be spread over? Yeah, I think you will start seeing the benefits flowing in the, in the second half of FI23, but the real benefit of the overall volume and the phosphoric acid backward integration will be something that we'll see in FY24. Yeah, so granulation benefit will come in H2 of FY23, the yeah. increased granulation capacity. But the fourth acid benefit, the real benefit, and by the time we stabilize the plant, will be in Q1 of uh, uh, next fiscal. So if you were to put this in the context of, say, volume growth, what is the kind of average volume growth you can expect, say, FY24? And then beyond that, in FI25, based on these capacity, yeah. we will be at a run rate of three million tons uh, per annum volume growth. You look at it today. We 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 are. I mean, we could just about end the year with about 20, 20 lakh tons of fertilizer, and we could well be at 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 a rate which is at least thirty five percent more than that. Okay, that's very useful. So one last thought in terms of the global ammonia and phosphoric acid capacity additions. Uh, if you can share some numbers in terms of what is the increase in capacity and how that would you know stabilize the supply chain to be useful. Well, as far as global um, ammonia capacities are concerned, we're not really seeing any any incremental ammonia capacity coming in globally, which is going to make a major difference to the current uh, demand supply position. So I think we should be very clear that uh, the the available quantity is what it is, and if there has been a disruption of ammonia coming in from uh, from Russia. 
which could which we which might come in uh, maybe sometime next year but uh, as far as the price are concerned uh, as i said in the beginning it's been holding at a particular range we're getting to see a 950 to 1000 dollar per metric ton of the ammonia range that we're seeing in india right now and what about phosphoric acid uh, because what i hear is there are constraints in terms of increasing uh, new capacity they have talked about some capacity in canada and one project in russia i believe is delayed so any thoughts in terms of when we see any phosphoric acid phosphoric acid capacity is a concern these are all long term projects and which needs a lot of tie up both in terms of rock sulfur and uh, disposal of uh, the by product which come in i we don't see any major phosphoric acid capacity kicking in anywhere in the world today yeah we do yeah, get just a, to, yeah. yeah just to add to what mr krishnan said you know what and this is something that we have repeated a number of times so um, so as far as ppl is concerned we have the long term tie up for most of our raw materials and we are in our view quite comfortably placed uh, to handle the increased requirement on a consistent and sustainable basis for the company so the most important requirement for us is p which is uh, both rock phosphate and phosphoric acid which we get from our promoter organization ocp through an arms length basis they do give us benefits for uh, for the for the volume that we take and for the fact that we are exclusive with ocp the only company in the country which is exclusive with ocp is ppl so we have that as far as ocp is own reserves and ability to supply p is concerned i think they are quite okay to 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 give 100% of our requirements for the next 500 years so we don't have we don't see any issue as far as uh, ppl is concerned when it comes to both phosphoric acid and rock phosphate when it comes to ammonia we've got uh, a long term tie up with several companies including say the qatar energy which is a uh, which is a, a very large supplier we have a, an aggregator like trans ammonia tramo we also have a, one another company with we have with which we have tie ups so our requirement of ammonia also will be split among these three companies and we don't foresee any issues in them being able to supply us our requirement on a long term basis when it comes to uh, uh, k which is potash we deal with the canadians we deal with uh, uh, the jordanians uh, we uh, to to some extent uh, the russians as well so we we have and the israelis so we there are four players from whom we take uh, uh, the potash and uh, with them as well even today earlier today there was one of the teams who, who came and we signed an mou with them to give us next year quantities potash also we don't see any issue sulfur also we have got uh, similar long term tie ups with uh, with uh, with three companies from whom we take so we do not foresee a uh, uh, um, a challenge in terms of securing our raw materials on a consistent basis going forward for the increased requirement of uh, of ppl as an organization which is at at, at 3 million uh, metric tons per annum so it's wonderful uh, engaging uh, in this call thank you very much for all the insightful uh, responses you gave thank you very much sir all the best thank, thank you. you ladies and gentlemen that would be our last question for today i now hand the conference over to the management for the closing comments thank you and over to you thank you everyone for joining uh, our h1 fi 2023 earnings call we we look forward to having more such interactions going forward For any further questions, please feel free to connect with our investment relations team. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of ICICI Securities, that concludes today's call. Thank you all for joining us, and you may now just connect your lines.